Okay. Well, welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed uh, Lab 6. Um, we'll be referring back to that a little bit as we go through and explore uh, qubit spectroscopy uh, and readout. Um, so what we're going to do today is explore something called the James Cummings Hamiltonian. And uh, this is one of our favorite Hamiltonians because it's kind of the simplest case of a non-trivial system that we can explore and study. Uh, we're going to go back to using um, treating the transmon as a qubit so that we can again use the poly matrices and simplify our calculations for uh, pedagogical reasons. Um, and just like yesterday, we're going to define the raising and lowering operators of the qubit in terms of these poly, poly x and y matrices. And um, remember that they raise the qubit state from 0 to 1. And because there's no state beyond 1 in this qubit approximation, unlike the transmon, uh, a raising operator acting on 1 will give you the vacuum. And likewise, a lowering operator on 0 will give you the vacuum, whereas it will raise 0 to 1 and lower 1 to 0. So uh, what we have now is the James Cummings Hamiltonian. And uh, it consists of three parts. So um, basically, we have two systems that we understand very well. We have the readout resonator, which is like a harmonic oscillator. And we have a qubit, which we're treating as a qubit now instead of an anharmonic oscillator, as uh, Zlatko would have told you about. And these dynamics are described by very uh, simple Hamiltonians, one uh, consisting of the readout resonator frequency, angular frequency here, multiplied by the number operator. So this just gives you the amount, the, the excitation state of the resonator, or equivalently, how many photons are in that resonator, because this is just representing the number operator. The second uh, uh, part of the Hamiltonian you might see is the qubit Hamiltonian we started with yesterday. It's just uh, the qubit itself. There's no drive term here. So this is just going to be a uh, minus one half times the qubit frequency for the ground state and plus one half times the qubit frequency for the uh, excited state. So it's just a simple two level system. So on its own, we completely understand how the resonator and the qubit work together. But instead, we're going to couple them now together um, via something we call an interaction term. And in fact, it's the same dipole interaction we talked about with the qubit drive. However, now, instead of applying the drive, we're going to be looking at the interaction between photons in the resonator and the excitations of the qubits. The interaction rate, so this is still a dipole interaction, but we're not considering explicitly a drive here. And in fact, everything becomes a lot more complicated when you do consider the drive on top of the readout resonator. But you can find an explanation of that also in the Qiskit textbook. Uh, for simplicity, we'll just consider the resonator and this simple dipole interaction right here. Uh, the interaction rate is given by this G, which is sometimes called the vacuum Rabi rate. And the two terms we have here represent the creation of a photon in the resonator by lowering the photon number down. So this essentially represents the qubit emitting a, going from the excited state and emitting a photon into the resonator while it transitions to the ground state. And vice versa, we also have the situation where we uh, destroy a photon in the resonator while promoting the uh, qubit state from 0 to 1. So this would be like representing the absorption of a photon from the resonator to excite the qubit. Um, so the other thing we have here is uh, we have this RWA to indicate we've already made the rotating wave approximation, uh, which is what we discussed yesterday. And in fact, physicists often make the rotating wave approximation so often that we just kind of know what terms to drop and what, what things to modify in the Hamiltonian. So this is very common, and I'm sure Zlatko's already uh, made a few RWA approximations in his lecture. Um, so the other thing about this Hamiltonian is that we can solve this exactly. Um, in fact, the qubit and resonator can form a hybrid state uh, when they're on resonance, um, but we're not really interested in going through the exact solution right here. What we're more interested in in treating the dipole interaction as a perturbation of the system, because we're going to operate in a regime called the dispersive regime, in which this uh, interaction strength is much, much less than the difference between the qubit and resonator frequency. So to give you an idea of what that is, is the um, resonator readout frequency is typically in the range of about 7 gigahertz, whereas the qubit frequency is typically around 5 gigahertz. Um, this dipole interaction G here is typically about tens of megahertz, so that is much, much smaller than the, uh, than the difference in the energy states. And this is what we mean by the dispersive regime. 
uh, it means that the resonator is going to still be mostly like a resonator, but going to take on some characteristics of the qubit. And likewise, the qubit's going to take on some aspects of the resonator, but it's going to mainly behave as a qubit. And we call this a dressing, and that the qubit dresses the resonator, and likewise, the resonator dress dresses the qubit. Uh, but we'll get to the point where we can see how we can observe the qubit and how we, uh, how we look at measurements and, uh, and the influence of the qubit on the readout resonator. So uh, moving on, we're going to do a you are going to use a method called the schrieffer wolf transformation, which will allow us to block diagonalize uh, our Hamiltonian. And so we're going to go through and kind of figure out what does that mean and how, how do we do it and how do we apply it to our system. Okay. So in the schrieffer wolf transformation, you have a Hamiltonian part that is diagonal, meaning it only has elements on the diagonal of the matrix, which corresponds to well-known energy states. Uh, this would be kind of like the solution of your quantum mechanical problem consists of diagonalizing the Hamiltonian. So this Hamiltonian, this James Cumming Hamiltonian in particular, uh, is represented by something that is well known, which is the resonator in the qubit states, and then a perturbation, which is the interaction between the two of them. And in, in for the James Cumming, uh, for the Schrieffer Wolf transformation in particular, we want to take that James Cumming Hamiltonian and further divide uh, that Hamiltonian up into a something we call block diagonal, which means we have sub matrices that are along the diagonal and a block non diagonal term. And uh, these blocks correspond to, in, in this case, different configurations of the system. Uh, in this case, it will be whether the qubit's in the ground or excited state, for example. Uh, the reason why this is very useful to do is because now we can play some tricks by just looking at the block diagonal and block non-diagonal components. For example, you can see if you multiply any two block diagonal matrices, the result will be a block diagonal matrix. However, if you multiply a block diagonal and a non-block diag block non-diagonal matrix, you will always get a block non-diagonal matrix. Also, if you multiply two block non-diagonal matrices, you will get a block diagonal matrix. So we can use the properties of these matrices to simplify the calculations that we wish to, wish to perform. So moving on, um, basically, this operator we want to do this block diagonalization is going to take a form of this, uh, this, uh, this block off-diagonal operator S, which is also anti hermitian will block diagonalize the Hamiltonian we're given. It could be any Hamiltonian um, with, a, uh, with a weak perturbation. Uh, but this will be our James Cumming Hamiltonian in this example. And you can derive an effective Hamiltonian um, by performing this transformation. And then we can use the, uh, I think it's called the baker house dyer campbell formula in order to write these, uh, this expression in terms of a series of generalized commutators. So these commutators are an extension of the commutators Lacko told you about, um, where we say the commutator of uh, H and S, I guess the first order commutator would be HS minus SH. Uh, and then we define the zeroth commutator to just be that uh, H, and then any higher order of the commutator is determined in terms of the commutator it's less than. So you get a essentially a nested series of commutators uh, it's not too difficult. You'll see how this works in, in practice. Um, but this is the expression for it, and this is something that we know how to calculate. So what we're going to do is we're going to treat the H1 and H2. So this is the uh, perturbation. Uh, H1 is the block diagonal part, and H2 is the block off diagonal part. And we're going to assume that S takes the form as a Taylor expansion. And so what this means is that by treating H1 plus H2 as a perturbation, we'll put a little lambda here to keep track of the order of that perturbation. Uh, likewise, we'll have lambdas on, on the higher order, on, on the orders of the terms of the Taylor expansion for S. So the higher order in lambda means less and less significant. And in fact, we'll carry it out to second order uh, in this calculation. Uh, the lambda more or less will just help us keep track of things. So by keeping track of these lambdas, we can start to perform this calculation for the uh, for the for the H0, H1, and H2 components of our matrix. So in particular, we have the Hamiltonian we started before. This comes from the zeroth order generalized commutator. Um, then we have a first order commutator that involves the Hamiltonian itself and the first uh, order of the Taylor expansion of S, of the S operator. Uh, then we have the next, uh, the second order commutator of um, uh, the second order commutator of the Hamiltonian and the first order Taylor expansion of the S operator. 
And then the next one we have here is the uh, first order commutator of the second order of the Taylor expansion of the S operator. And I'm um, just stopping there because we can see that all these terms will include uh, everything up to second order and lambda and a few more. And then in the next line, what we're going to do is collect those terms so that we have zeroth order and lambda as H naught, first order and lambda, and second order and lambda. And then we've just thrown all the other terms away because we're not going to worry about those today. This will give us um, you know, a picture of the physics that we're interested in exploring. So at this point, we've expanded our effective Hamiltonian. Now what kinds of properties do we need to have? And this is the next trick of the schrieffer wolf transformation. Well, it turns out that what we want to do here is we want to block diagonalize, or you could also rephrase that as taking the, non, the block non-diagonal and uh, setting that equal to zero. And that's exactly what this expression is here. So this is just considering our effect of Hamiltonian and calculating the parts that are uh, block off diagonal. So what that means is, because we know H1, H0 is diagonal and H1 is block diagonal, uh, this matrix H0 plus H1 is going to be block diagonal. Uh, then it is going to be commutated with an off diagonal matrix, a block off diagonal matrix S. And we can see that any, any odd order of that is going to be block off diagonal, which means this is going to be exactly the term we want to get rid of. So we know the combination in these brackets will always be block off diagonal because it's the odd order of this generalized commutator. And likewise, we have a block off diagonal uh, matrix H2 along with our block off diagonal matrix S and any uh, even order of that commutator is going to be block off diagonal as well. So that will also be set e equal to zero. So this is the trick that we will use to evaluate those terms in our Hamiltonian. So if we expand this off diagonal, block off diagonal uh, matrix, we see that we can get essentially the uh, first order commutator of the um, H0 and, and perturbed H1 part, along with the first order, uh, first, first order of the Taylor expansion of S. And then we have this uh, lambda H2 term, which comes from the zeroth order commutator of this second part right here. And then we can go in and we can see that we have then the, uh, the first order commutator of this term using the second order of the Taylor expansion of S. And um, continuing, then we'll have the third order commutator of the of uh, the H0 plus lambda H1 with the first order of the Taylor expansion. And continuing on, then we have the second order of second order generalized commutator of this H2 uh, uh, with the first order of the Taylor expansion of S. Okay, so that's a lot of terms right there, but luckily most of them we can throw away because they're higher than second order. And so when we collect the terms together, we get a simpler equation. And then we just have two terms in this lambda term and then two terms in this lambda squared term. So this is pretty easy to deal with to second order. And what that means is because this off diagonal terms need to go away is that we can set each of these equal to zero identically. And that means that H, H0 commuted with uh, the first order Taylor expansion, uh, sorry, the first order Taylor term of S is minus H2. And likewise, the uh, commutator of H0 with the second order, um, second, order, ex second order term of the Taylor expansion of S is equal to minus the H1 with the first order Taylor expansion of S, first order term. So, Moving on, we can, take the, this, we can take those equations and go back to our effective Hamiltonian that we wanted to expand and just make the substitutions and let lambda go back to one because we're not, we don't need to keep track of the order anymore. And we see that we actually get a, something that's relatively easy to calculate. And it's just taking the, um, taking the H2, which was the perturbative part that was block off diagonal and replacing it with one half times the commutator of H2 with this, uh, the first order term of the Taylor expansion of S. So all we need to do now is find this S1 term for our second order Schrieffer-Wolf uh, 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 transformation. And, and this is what we'll do. And um, this is a uh, kind of a, something we do in physics a lot. In fact, we, we call it an ansatz. And an ansatz is a fancy German word that means guess. And that means we make a guess and then we prove to ourselves later that it works. And then by some sort of uniqueness theorem, we know that we guessed correctly because we're smart people. 
Uh, so in particular, there's not really a, um, you usually don't see a kind of formulaic uh, equation for this, but then this uh, method appeared on the archive very recently that does provide a systematic way of forming an ansatz. And so what this consists of essentially, and this is what we're going to follow today, is calculating this operator eta, which is the commutator of H naught and H two of our original Hamiltonian. And then this, we're gonna take that eta and we're gonna replace the coefficients such that the commutator of H naught and eta is equal to H two. And then by freeing those uh, coefficients, we can satisfy this equation and we can then say that this eta that we determined is going to be the same as S1 due to the uniqueness theorem. So this is exactly what we'll follow, but we're going to actually do the calculations. And by do the calculations, I mean we're going to use a Python library called SymPy for symbolic Python to do the calculations for us because I'm an experimentalist and um, this is how I do theory, I guess. Uh, so let me uh, just kind of walk you through this, this package. So we're going to import uh, SymPy as, as SP, and then we're gonna define some symbols. In particular, we're gonna define our uh, resonator uh, angular frequency, our qubit angular frequency, and our G, which is our vacuum Rabi coupling between the resonator and the qubit. Uh, delta we're gonna use later, it's going to be the detuning or difference in frequency between the resonator and qubit. Um, so then we need to start importing the operators that will do the raising and lowering uh, in, in the James Cummings Hamiltonian. So we're going to import the boson operator. So this essentially creates a photon or this destroys a photon and the complex conjugate or conjugate transpose of it will create a photon. And we can um, manipulate these objects with things such as uh, poly matrices, the dagger which performs the complex, trans complex conjugate transpose, uh, commutators, which as you saw, we are going to need, and then normal ordering form, which uh, takes the operators and puts all of the creation operators on the left and all of the annihilation operators on the right, um, because that will simplify our calculation and allow us to see what's going on. Okay, uh, likewise, we need to define our poly matrices, and we do this as uh, SX, SY, and SZ for the X, Y, and Z poly matrices we talked about at the very beginning, as well as the qubit raising and lowering operators, sigma plus and sigma minus. These are all part of the library um, you know, already, already in there. So now we can start writing down our, um, our uh, Hamiltonians, but one thing I forgot to do was actually execute these cells, so I need to load these into memory. So let's do that right here. Okay, so now I should have everything in memory and I should be able to write down my James Cummings Hamiltonian using SymPy. So let's see if this works. And there we go. That's uh, exactly the same Hamiltonian that we started with in the beginning. I think the, the orders got swapped a little bit, but it's what we want to begin with. Okay, so then uh, what we need to do is we need to calculate this commutator, eta, which is going to be our systematic ensemble that we came up with. Um, from that paper, and uh, this is the commutator that SymPy gives us, but we need this to be evaluated now. So we need to use um, these methods uh, that are part of SymPy called do it, which actually performs the commutation, uh, expand, which expands the terms, normal order form will put the uh, A's and A daggers in the correct form, and Q simplify poly will we'll take care of the uh, poly algebra. So when we go th through and do that, we see that we get uh, four terms. In fact, this can be divided into two terms. One of them is going to have a dagger sigma minus, which is these two, and the other term is gonna be a sigma plus. So uh, these two, uh, but we want this um, thing to be equal to H2. So, Yeah, so, oh, yeah, so we need to change the, um, the, the coefficients, so we're going to label those by A and B as well, because we're going to substitute those coefficients as, as uh, the systematic uh, provision of the ansatz indicates. So, by taking um, those two terms I mentioned and then giving them uh, these coefficients A and B before them, we can uh, perform this commutator and set them equal to each other. So this is the commutator that we've arrived at now. It's, it's very similar. It has the two, uh, two terms, a dagger sigma minus and a sigma plus. And then that needs to be equal to our, our expression for H2, which we can just evaluate here. It's just G times those two numbers. So in fact, we can just factor uh, those and set A and B both equal to G over delta, where delta or the detuning is the difference between the angular uh, frequencies of the resonator and qubit. 
So in that case, we can do substitutions of those coefficients uh, using SymPy and then factor them to get our, uh, our S1. And then we can take that S1 that we found and we can calculate the whole effect of Hamiltonian that we are interested in figuring out. And we have to do this by taking the commutator of H2S1, um, actually doing it, expanding them, simplifying the terms and all that other stuff that we did. But we can execute that cell block. And we get our final results, which is where we want to be. But I'm going to take that final result and write it in a, in a kind of different form. And this is the effective Hamiltonian of the James Cumming form that we're looking for. And this is a kind of uh, can explain a lot of the um, a lot of the features of our resonator and qubit system. So let's take a moment and explore this. So if we look at the first term, we see the a dagger a, which corresponds to creating photons in the resonator. But now it's multiplying a term that has a, a sigma z on it. And what that means now is that the readout resonator frequency is dependent on the state of the qubit. So in fact, how we perform measurements is when we, when we um, after we manipulate the, the, the qubits, we will collapse the qubit into a state, and this, that state of the qubit will change the readout resonator frequency, uh, and we can observe that with a measurement pulse. So this is very interesting here. Uh, and in fact, this, um, uh, this, this uh, shift here is called the AC Stark shift, uh, and, and that, that changes the qubit frequency. And then we also have another uh, shift called the Lamb shift, which is due to quantum uh, quantum vacuum fluctuation. So it's a slight modification of the qubit frequency. Um, alternatively, you can also see that if you move um, this term over here, then you can see that the that the qubit frequency also depends on the number of photons in the resonator. Uh, so that's another thing that, um, that that you can look at, but something that we're not going to explore today. So today we're looking um, we're looking mainly at observing the qubit frequency. Uh, by something called spectroscopy and seeing how the readout changes, uh, the properties of the readout resonator change with, uh, with the dependence on the qubit state. Uh, so this is what we're going to explore. And we're going to be exploring it using uh, OpenPulse again. Uh, so uh, first of all, we're going to do things that, um, we're going to do things that are going to be very similar to yesterday. Um, Essentially, we're going to start out by importing all the same similar kinds of libraries, but we're going to create different pulse schedules. So I'm going to go through and we're going to uh, use uh, IBMQ RMOC, which is a publicly available uh, Qiskit pulse enabled uh, backend that everyone has access to. But I'm going to just pull the jobs from the library. So I can go through and I can see that the estimated frequency is 4.97, so near 5 gigahertz. Uh, I can get the SI prefixes uh, that I need for everything. And then I'm going to set up the frequency sweep. So uh, we're going to look at the center frequency that we already asked. Uh, we asked Armok what its center frequency was. And we're just going to sweep around it um, by t plus or minus 20 megahertz. So um, let's see, to make sure I run, run everything. Yeah, OK. So uh, we're going to import Pulse from Qiskit. And then uh, just a little note here. So because this is a real backend, we can ask the backend what its, uh, what its measurement pulse is. We can also see what its X pulse is. So an X pulse is in 180 degree rotation around the uh, X axis of the block sphere. And because we already know these, we don't need to uh, build them as we've done in, in some other cases, such as when we use the simulator. Uh, but similarly, we're going to create all the necessary channels. So these are three of the channels. We're not using a control channel. That's mainly for two qubit interactions. And uh, I think I need to execute that. That's correct. And then we're going to go down here and build our uh, frequency sweep. So essentially, we're going to come up with a schedule, which is uh, we'll call frequency sweep. And then we're just going to add an X pulse to it. And then we're going to add a measurement pulse to it and shift the duration, the beginning of the um, the beginning of the schedule to the beginning of the duration. So uh, remember that we had this um, yesterday as well. So then we're going to go through each one of these frequencies that we set, and we're going to schedule the frequencies uh, so that we're changing the frequency of the drive for each one of these qubits. So this will go through the array of frequencies we made later using this method, and we're going to set what we call the local oscillator frequency, which will be the drive frequency of the pulses that we apply so we can do this frequency sweep and see what the qubit 
uh, we can see what the uh, cubic frequency is, uh, particularly the zero one transition. So what this schedule looks like is it's going to be a uh, drive pulse. I'm sorry, the labels don't come out here in the dark mode. Um, so we have uh, these channels, the acquire channel, the drive channel, and the measurement channel. So remember that the drive channel generally corresponds to the resonant frequency of the qubit. So this blue pulse right here, this Gaussian thing, is uh, the default qubit pulse that we're going to apply uh, to, uh, to our qubit, to IBM QRMonk. And if you look very closely, you can see that there's a little, a little, um, a little function down here. This is because this pulse that we're actually going to apply to the system is a drag pulse. It's not a pure Gaussian. So a drag pulse means in the 90 degree out of phase quadrature, we're going to add the derivative of the Gaussian to that pulse. And that can help with, um, uh, that helps, uh, helps with uh, certain kinds of calibration problems for our qubits. Okay, um, so I'm going to uh, assemble the schedule and turn this program into, a, into an object. So we're going to use the IPMQ RMOC. We're going to use measurement level one, uh, which is going to give us the kind of uh, IQ integrated data. We're going to take averages of those for each one of these frequencies. We're going to do 1,024 um, experiments for each one of those. And then we're going to go through and, and do these scheduled local oscillators. Is going to be this array of different frequencies, which contains our sweep. But you can see that it's, it's very simple from this schedule. There's only one thing in the schedule because it's the same pulse, and the frequency is changing by virtue of this uh, schedule frequencies array down here. So let's execute that. And then we could run the job on an actual device, which is what this code would do here for you. Uh, but I've already run it on an actual device, so I'm going to retrieve the data um, from a previous run. And then I can take that result and put it into my frequency sweep results array. And then I want to uh, extract the values and plot. So uh, what I can do is just take the values and, um, and get it from the memory, multiply it by a scale factor that you need for the experimental systems because uh, just scales that occur in the systems. Append the results. Um, this is stuff that I will tuck under the hood for you in the homework. And then we can plot that. And so what does this look like? This looks like, uh, if we can see it down here at the bottom, is that when we're off resonant uh, of the qubit, we're driving the qubit somehow, but we're not exciting it from the zero to the one state. So the qubit's staying in the zero state. And so we're getting the, re the resonator frequency corresponding to the qubit in the zero state in all of these. So we get some background corresponding to that amplitude. However, when we actually get close to the qubit, in particular on qubit frequency, we start driving uh, that qubit into the excited state, which means when we apply a measurement, we, uh, we collapse the qubit to the excited state, and that gives the readout resonator a shifted uh, resonant frequency, which is the signal that we pick up. But we only pick up that signal when we are on resonance with the qubit. So this is uh, what it looks like, where you can see here this, this signal is going to be um, arbitrary, um, and the frequency of the sweep, which is a little, maybe a little hard to say, the frequencies in gigahertz down here, um, and that's right where we predicted the, um, the qubit frequency would be because we asked the qubit what its frequency was because it's, this is a real back end. Okay, well, we typically want to take the data and we want to do some fitting to it. So we're going to use a SciPy, Scientific Python package, to do some curve fitting. And we're going to fit this to a Lorentzian. This is also something that um, you don't need to worry about because we will, uh, uh, we will tuck that away in another helper module for you. Um, so when we do the fit, and then we just kind of go back to our Hamiltonian so we remember what's going on, uh, we, can, we can see exactly that. We can see uh, we get, a, uh, we, we get a, a qubit that's fit around uh, its F01, which is our 0 to 1 transition frequency that fits the Sorensian function, and it fits quite well with the background data. Um, corresponding to this shift, whether this sigma z is a plus or minus one eigenvalue, which corresponds to the zero or one state of the qubit. So that's how uh, you can observe the qubit state vis-a-vis -vis the measurement of a, the change in a readout resonator frequency. And so this is uh, essentially the circuit quantum electrodynamics uh, architecture that is very, you know, most commonly used in uh, superconducting qubit architectures. Okay, so then the next thing we want to do is maybe we just want to monitor the effect of the readout resonator itself, and dependent on what the state of the qubit is. That is something that's also very interesting. 
and something we often do in the lab. So what we're going to do here is we're going to create two schedules. One of them is going to be a schedule of a measurement of the qubit and a measurement of the readout resonator when the qubit is in the zero state. And the other one is a measurement of the resonator when the qubit is in the one state. Um, so we need to build these pulse schedules and then we can execute them. There's going to be one schedule for zero and one schedule for one. However, we're going to need to change the frequencies uh, for each of these. So uh, what does this look like? Well, when we draw the zero schedule, um, by default, the qubits start in the zero state. So we don't need to apply any control pulses to the qubit. So there is nothing on the drive channel here. Um, we're just going to assume the qubit started in the zero state, and we're going to perform a measurement and an acquisition. Um, now, when we want the qubit in the one state, we need to apply a pi pulse here. And we know exactly how to do that because uh, we asked Armonk what a pi pulse was for that particular system, which of course gets calibrated on a you know, daily basis. Um, but now here we, we have the same measurement in acquire channels, but now we've prepared the qubit in the one state. Okay, so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to look around the uh, readout resonator frequency. So let's say we're, we're gonna look in a span of about 320 kilohertz. So these numbers can depend on the um, kinds of things such as the bandwidth of the resonator, how strong the coupling is between the qubit and the resonator as given by the G and the detuning of, uh, of the detuning between the readout resonator and the uh, qubit. And in fact, if you go to the Kiskit textbook, you can see how a lot of these parameters are determined by experiments um, in, in a very similar kind of way. So uh, I executed this cell and we know what our, uh, our qubit our, um, well, the qubit in the zero state will give an estimated readout resonator frequency of about 6.99 gigahertz. And so we're going to do a sweep around that value again, where I, we have asked the, um, the, the system, what is its readout resonator frequency? These are parameters that we need to know. Okay. So, uh, for this dispersive shift, we'll do even more shots and um, we're going to step through another array of frequencies. However, these frequencies are going to be going into a schedule oscillator of the measurement channel, not the, uh, not the qubits. So uh, for the cavity sweep, we're, we're doing these around different frequencies, around 7 gigahertz as opposed to 5 gigahertz, but it works in much the same way. And so we can assemble a quantum object that has the schedule zero, uh, the same kinds of parameters, uh, and then one for the the schedule one. So we've got cavity sweep zero corresponding to a sweep when the qubit is prepared in the ground state and uh, sweep around the cavity resonator frequency when the qubit is prepared in the one state. And that's what those mean. Okay, and then likewise, we can run these jobs on the back end, um, but I've already done that uh, in the interest of brevity. And so I'm just going to pull these jobs from memory and put those results from those jobs into these two arrays, cavity sweep zero results, cavity sweep one results. Let's see if we can do that. Okay, so uh, we are going to save our scale factor again, and we're going to go through, and these will extract the data from memory. These are things, um, things that will be hidden for you in the homework. And then what we're gonna do is plot this, uh, both of the zero and one on the same plot. And we haven't plotted it yet. Now we're gonna plot it. And let's take a look at what we see. So uh, on the, on the um, bottom X, on the X axis is going to be the uh, readout resonator frequency that we're sweeping. And of course the peaks or dips correspond to the resonant, uh, resonant frequencies of the resonator. Uh, however, we have two sweeps of them, the blue one corresponding to when the qubit is prepared in the zero state and the red one, um, for when the qubit is prepared in the one state. And we kind of use these colors, blue for being cold and red for being hot as cited. Um, so we can see the difference between the readout resonator frequency between these two. So this is a direct uh, observation of those parameters we saw from the James Cumming Hamiltonian after performing the Schrieffer wolf transformation. So we've kind of come full circle and gone back to, uh, gone back to the uh, equation we wanted to observe. Uh, so this is all in the, um, uh, all in the Kiskit textbook as well. So uh, if you have any questions, I put the relevant chapters at the end of the homework. So what we want to do now is continue on and go through uh, just an overview of the uh, lab seven exercise. And there's just one exercise um, inside this one. Uh, and a lot of it's gonna look the same because a lot of the, uh, a lot of the 
same preparations for this exercise need to be done because for Pulse, we need to uh, make everything in the same way. But I also wanted to just keep everything here for completeness. Um, but, but this is exactly the same as Lab 6 so far. We're going to be doing spectroscopy instead. We're going, we have the necessary packages. We're going to treat the transmon as a duffing oscillator, um, as um, you, you will have seen from Zlatko today. Uh, and then I just have an overview of the Kiskit Pulse and a little brief description of what the channels correspond to and some of the instructions. But we have, uh, we'll go through each of those uh, as well. And then if you're curious, where do these, uh, where do these waveforms actually go for a real quantum device? Uh, and uh, you can do that on IBM QR Monk, but we'll be using the simulator again today too. So we're pretty much starting here. We're gonna make use of the helper module again. You'll need to press shift enter to execute each one of these blocks. Um, but we're gonna start out with the same steps. We're going to instant, instantiate a uh, the transmon as a duffing oscillator, about five gigahertz. We're gonna import libraries and we're gonna set our correct channels. So this is uh, just the same as uh, yesterday. There's going to be a little bit of a trick that we're going to use here. And that's because we're using a simulator. And um, for the simulator, we can only have one frequency for the drive frequency. Uh, so one, a single local oscillator frequency, which means we cannot make an array of local oscillator frequencies as we did for the IBM Q Armonk backend. So we're gonna use a trick called sideband modulation, which allows us to achieve a radio frequency pulse, which is applied to the qubit, that is equal to the local oscillator frequency, plus, it could be minus, a sideband frequency. So uh, you can do that essentially by, um, by multiplying each sample of your pulse by a complex exponential, which will effectively allow you to change the frequency of that pulse. And we're going to tuck away the details of that and put it in the helper module as well. But this is a very common, uh, a common way that you can manipulate signals. And it's the one we're going to apply so that we can put the sweep of the frequency into the actual pulses that we're generating ourselves instead of changing the local oscillator as we did on uh, Armonk. So we're going to go through and see how this is done uh, by looking at spectroscopy of the zero one transition, uh, just like we did on Armonk, but we're going to do this with the simulator. So we're going to create our measurement pulse as was done. Um, we, uh, I'm sorry, that's not the measurement pulse here. Uh, we're going to create our spectroscopy pulse um, and go through a range between five and 5.2 um, gigahertz. And what we're going to do here is construct a schedule. We're gonna use the same kind of uh, amplitude. This is going to be the same for all our pulses, just a large amplitude uh, Gaussian pulse of 128 sample duration, 16 uh, 16 sample sigma, and we're using the pulse library to create this Gaussian here. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so uh, what we what we're going to do here is um, instead of going into the math, there's a helper function called applied sideband, and what that's going to do is it's going to essentially do this uh, this computation for you and allow you to change the frequency of that spectroscopy pulse. So. We're taking the spec pulse, which is the same for everything, and we're creating a sideband spec pulse, which is that same pulse, but now each one of them is going to be multiplied by a different sideband. And that goes for the freaks in all of these spectroscopy frequencies uh, that you have here. Um, so this is the, um, the schedule that you create, and then you're going to play that sideband spectroscopy pulse on, um, on the drive channel and, and add it to the spectroscopy schedule. You're gonna add the measurement pulse as before, and then we're going to append this to uh, the list of schedules that we want. So there's going to be one of these for each frequency, for each frequency and the spectroscopy frequency. And uh, you're going to draw it and you can check it out. And then you're going to assemble a quantum object called SPEC01. Uh, because this is an actual transmon now, or this is a duffing oscillator, which has higher order levels, um, because it's an anharmonic oscillator, as you saw before. Uh, then we're going to run it on the oscillator and we're going to take those values and fit them to a Lorentzian function, which is the function of this form. And by fitting the data to this form, we can extract the F01 parameter, which is the 01 transition frequency. And all that's completely done for you. Your exercise for today is going to just be spectroscopy of the one to two transition. So let's see how we do that. So first of all, we need to excite, before we can excite from the one to the two state, we need to excite from the zero to the one state. And because this is a, um, because this is a simulated backend, I cannot ask it what its pi pulse is. I need to know what the pi pulse is, or I need to figure, do an experiment to create it. And that's exactly what we did yesterday. So I'm just taking the value from the Rabi experiments from lab six and just putting the amplitude in here and just building a Gaussian pulse 
uh, out of it. It's not a drag pulse, but you know, it's good enough for our purposes today. Now, the enharmonicity, which is the difference between the 0, 1, and 1, 2 transition frequencies for our superconducting qubits, is typically in the ballpark of minus 300 megahertz. Minus 300 megahertz because the 1, 2 transition is smaller. So if our qubit frequency is about 5 gigahertz, uh, that's the 0, 1 transition, then our 1, 2 transition is expected to be around 4.7 gigahertz. So what we're going to do is just build sideband frequencies around the guess of minus 300 megahertz. And this is done for you already in here. And then you just need to add some code that will, that will put in the right um, pulses into your schedule so that when you go and you build that for each frequency and you append it to all of your schedules, uh, you get the correct schedule. You can draw those schedules and you can assemble those. That will be your answer. Uh, this is the only problem uh, in this exercise. And then you can build it and you can do spectroscopy. And uh, all of this should, should get you the correct frequency of something where you will yield a 1, 2 transition frequency, and then we'll calculate the anharmonicity uh, that's observed on this simulator for you. So um, don't forget to uh, put your name and email in here and, and execute this block as well. That'll allow you to be graded. And then um, put the relevant textbook sections, Kiskit textbook sections here. Circuit quantum electrodynamics. We'll review the James Cumming Hamiltonian with you and the Schrieffer Wolf transformation. Accessing higher energy states will tell you how to um, do these exercises with pulse if you're, if you're more interested. There's a lot more information about um, readout resonators and measurement levels one and two uh, in the Kiskit textbook if you're curious about this kind of thing. Uh, and then similarly, there's the, um, the, the videos you can watch with either me or Lauren uh, explaining different concepts in pulse to you. And so with that, I'd like to uh, thank you for your attention, and I'm, I'm very happy to have gotten to do two labs with you this week, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the global, Kiskit Global Summer School. You take care, everyone.